Hello. How are y'all doing? So I have a foot announcement. I heard a rumor that we're trending in the United States. We're number one or number two? I don't know. We're number, we're number one and two, like Beyonce says. You can be one and two. So, yeah. So anyway, remember to tweet along with us at home and here and give us your questions and we'll continue this conversation going. But up next, we have our next candidate who you all may have heard of. He's a very excitable person because um, he's a part of our community. And I would like to introduce Mayor Pete Buttigieg. So, Mr. Mayor, our first question for tonight is, what can these people and the people at home who are LGBTQ expect from you in your first 100 days as president? And I will leave the stage so you can give that conversation to them. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for being here, and thanks for everyone for making this conversation possible, because it would have been unimaginable as a part of the presidential election process just a few years ago. Here's what you can expect from me. First of all, a president who understands that all politics is personal, not just local, but personal, precisely because of my experience as a member of the LGBTQ community. You know, this is the anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And thanks to everybody who was part of the activism that helped make that happen. I remember serving under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I also remember the weight lifted when that was no longer a threat to my career. And yet we know that so many Americans are still finding that they are treated as less than, including trans military members right now who were willing to put their lives on the line for this country. So one thing you can expect from me on day one is to end the war on trans Americans coming from this White House. <clears throat> you can obviously expect me to sign the Equality Act the moment that it hits my desk. You can also expect me to appoint an administration and a judiciary that understands that American freedom means the freedom to be who you are and love who you love. <clears throat> You can expect housing policies that recognize that 40% of homeless youth right now are LGBTQ and recognize the need for equality in housing. And let me tell you, if anybody, let alone a cabinet member in my administration, spoke the way that the Secretary of Housing and Ur Urban Development spoke yesterday about trans people, that would be their last day in federal service on my watch. <laughs> You can expect an end to harmful practices like conversion therapy, and it's going to take federal leadership to make sure that that is no longer practiced in states around the country. But there's more than just the policies. There's a culture of belonging that we need to establish in this country, because right now, we got from the president on down voices telling just about everybody for different reasons that you don't fit because of where you came from, what you look like, how you worship, and yes, very much because of who you love or who you are, people are being told they don't belong. That will end when I am president because we need to do the exact reverse. We got a crisis of belonging in this country. And one of the reasons I am so proud to be a member of this community is I think we have the power to reach into our own experiences, belonging to a part of America that also cuts across all of the other different categories. I can only assume the only minority that exists in equal proportion across every ethnicity, family, and income group. We could help be that glue. And I'm seeing the body language like maybe I've gone on too long, so yes, I'll go to my seat. You're out of time for that. That's what you can expect when I'm president. Well. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And you know, you spoke very passionately about being a member of the community, and I'd love to start there tonight. Um, so the FDA has recently changed their ban on uh, blood, uh, blood donation on gay men or any man that has sex with men from a lifetime ban to now a one-year ban if you've abstained from sex. What this would mean that you would be, if you became president, you'd become the first man in office to not be able to give blood while serving the country that he's leading. 
I would like to know your thoughts on this policy, and also more broadly, how does it feel as a gay man to be running for an office in which when, if you became president, you would still not be equal anymore? You know, I remember uh, uh, the first time I saw that uh, it was an item on my schedule that I could have a chance to promote uh, the traditional annual South Bend Mayor's Office blood drive. And it's a great thing that we do. And then I realized I can't, mm -hmm. I can't be part of it. Um, we still do it, and it's still a good thing. But it's an example, one of many examples of the exclusions that continue in this country. And it is one of the reasons why we need to move to something that is actually informed by medically accurate, non-discriminatory basis. Whether it's things like uh, the ban on blood or other things that relate to the treatment of HIV positive people in America, including their opportunities to serve. Uh, we are still living with the long tail of prejudices that should have been abandoned a long time ago. And in this current environment, there is a, a level of hostility toward science and fact. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to make sure that we embrace reality, uh, especially when our refusal to do so has harmed people because of who they are. So what would you do with the ban, though? Would you consider, I'll let people up. Would you consider changing it from a year and eradicating it totally, or are you interested in kind of keeping it going? I would direct the FDA to reevaluate it to make sure that what we are doing is consistent with what medicine tells us, not with old prejudices. Okay. All right. So our next question is about Iowa. Uh, Iowa legislators recently reintroduced religious exemption legislation modeled after the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, allowing individuals to claim broad exemptions from generally applicable laws, including laws that regulate health and public safety. In the 21 states where religious exemption laws are on the books, they are often weaponized to discriminate against LGBTQ people, religious minorities, single parents, and more uh, and more. And the person who really uh, popularized this was your, uh, not your friend, but the governor, Mike Pence, who you worked with a lot. Um, and not, that was not shady at all. That's, I say Mike Pence, and I'm like, oh, Mike Pence. Uh, um, so <laughs> we would like to know, how are you going to handle RIFRAs on the national scale as president of the United States? Yeah, unfortunately, I got a lot of experience dealing with this because this approach was largely pioneered in Indiana. Yes. Uh, and the thing that is so upsetting is that it not only is abusive toward LGBTQ Americans, but in my view, it's abusive toward the idea of faith. Hmm. It, <laughs> faith is supposed to be about making people whole and making people better off. And when faith is used as an excuse to harm somebody, to me that is an insult to religion itself, not to mention everybody discriminated against. Um, <laughs> now, what, what we saw in Indiana, what was extraordinary, was the coalition of people who rose up to push back. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there uh, as a mayor, but uh, uh, Republican mayors were there right with Democratic mayors. The business community revolted. Uh, even NASCAR said they were disappointed. That's how you know yeah. you're getting something. Yeah, NASCAR moved. <laughs> and so, you know, I think this is really a rear guard out of action that is out of step with the American people. And as president, part of how I would push back on those efforts, I mean, needless to say, first of all, you won't see them embraced from the White House to begin with. But also, uh, you will see a call to what the American people already know, which is even those who, and we should recognize that there are people from a certain generation who've been brought up to reject who we are. Mm -hmm. And they're on a journey, and we should help them rather than drag them into the right place. Um, but through the lens of compassion, we have an opportunity to engage an American majority that knows that this is not the right thing to do, not for religion and certainly not for civil rights in America. Are you fearful? <laughs> you know, I, I think we're both from very religious backgrounds. I'm from the rural South. And, you know, I, I love that you're saying this. And I, I want to know, do you find kind of or, or any risk there? You know, a rural or religious community is really going to get behind this idea. Um, and do you see this as a route to really make change? Because, you know, I would want nothing more than to see the churches I grew up in really change, but do you think that's actually going to happen? I think it can happen when we ask people to be attuned to the importance of comp compassion and supporting each other. You know, so often, a young person in distress, the church is one of the places they want to go for help yeah. and support. And I do think that instinct is in... 
I, I would hope that instinct is in anybody who is in a church, even if they're misguided on uh, what their faith is, is telling, how their faith is telling them to treat other people. And I think in the name of that compassion, look, you'll never get everybody. And I learned that the hard way when I came out. But um, it is amazing how many people can move past those old harms when you appeal to what is best in them. And I think the function of leadership, especially presidential leadership, is to bring out the best of what's already somewhere inside of us. So, yeah, one more question, one more question. Um, so we have one question from Bryce Smith, who lives in Adele, Iowa. Um, and they write, in many parts of rural Iowa and America, access to healthcare is scarce and hard to get to, and it's even harder and more exclusive for members of the, uh, exclusionary for members of the LGBTQ community. As president, what will you do to not only expand healthcare across rural America, but go above and beyond to make sure LGBTQ individuals get the healthcare they need wherever they live? So one of the things we've got to do is reinvigorate health equity as part of our healthcare strategy. Not only, we, you can look everywhere else to see our debate over healthcare coverage, but we've also got to make sure that we engage the capabilities of, uh, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services, which should have a reinvigorated health equity task force to look, we already know about pervasive racial inequities in health mm -hmm. outcomes and health care. And the same is true when it comes to LGBTQ folks. Uh, we can do something about that. And I propose that we fund health equity zones that help tackle these issues. Uh, and there should be local solutions, but federal dollars, uh, so that we specifically identify the ways in which health is, healthcare is more difficult to access for people because of a category that they belong to. We got an obligation to do that. And if we just have a more uh, culturally competent and uh, frankly, just plain more diverse medical uh, profession, uh, a lot of these things begin to get better because there's somebody in the room to say, wait a minute, the way we're doing this isn't reaching everybody. All right. Well, that is our time tonight. Thank you so much for being here. It was great chatting with you. Nice to see you.